everybody. Welcome to our first on location digging deep. We're here at our bulb fulfillment center where we ship out our bulbs and our perennial plants. I'm Tara. I'm going to be your host. I'm Cody. I'm the horticulturist here. And you'll notice that we have a special guest with us today. This is the first of two guests we'll be having on today's episode. This is Glenn Holmes, our bulb manager. Hello, everybody. Hi, Glenn. So tell me, how long have you been working at Vessies? I've been working at Vessies for 12 years. And what is your favorite thing about working at Vessies? I think, I think the favorite thing is just that I'm, I am an avid gardener. I um, uh, often will have neighbors stop by and we've been outside all day and we look bad and we smell bad and uh, neighbors will comment that, gee, you're working so hard. But never did it seem like when you're in the garden that you're working. It's just, it's always fun. It's very therapeutic. And I love how things change and every spring you're just filled with the joy of what's going to happen. My day hardly ever really feels like work. Absolutely, yeah. I, often people will say, what's it like working at Vessies? I said, well, it, my question would be, ask a child if they like working at Disney. The response is the same. It's just, yeah. That's a good response. Yeah. yeah. You missed a really good day today, though, because it was Brenda's birthday. It was. And there, there was, was like good food. Two cakes, a trifle, all the dips. It, the I only know. thing we were missing from Disney was the fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, another question. Um, okay. How is the bulb and perennial program different from our seed program? Um, well, basically, the, the seed catalog, which most of our customers are familiar with, is an annual uh, catalog. Uh, and we have a spring and a fall bulb catalog, so two separate seasons. Uh, from the spring catalog, we would have printed this catalog last August, uh, and customers could order from the catalog or online from that August till now, mm -hmm. but we've just started shipping the product uh, from this catalog uh, from middle of April till probably the end of May. And then the fall bulb catalog, which is just hot off the press, um, customers can order from that now, but we won't be shipping you know, tulips and daffodils till mid-September to the end of October or so. Um, but it's, uh, the other great thing is that um, once you get this catalog and these items are posted online, is that you, could, you can go to you know, the fall bulb catalog, for example, you can go pick your favorites. Mm -hmm. Get them on an order that we reserve for you, but you're not billed until we actually ship, which yeah. could be the end of September. So it's like buy now and pay later. People love that. Yeah, Thank it's you. a great indication seeing you know a lot of the spring stuff flowering now. It's like, I oh, know. shoot, I didn't get that. It's like, I can still go get that right now. I can still go get it right now. I see in all the gardening groups online the FOMO that's happening. They're like, where can I go get tulip bulbs right now? And you can't. It's, it's too late, but you can secure yours for next year. Absolutely, you're right. Um, so what do you consider when you're selecting new varieties for these catalogs? A couple of things, but basically our, um, our growers and our vendors basically uh, come up with lots of uh, slide presentations. So they'll show us a range of a bunch of new things that are uh, available. Uh, and we kind of flip through them. And myself, Jeremy and myself, who you'll meet later, will flip through them and decide we like this, we don't like that. But vendors and growers have lots of reasons about why uh, we should pick something based on how it's performed in their trial gardens. Um, one of the things we like is that if we're working with a grower who, uh, who has just got a new item on the market, so maybe there's only a thousand available, so um, they're often offered to us with a whole 1,000 lot, so we can secure it and then it's, then it's exclusive to us, and that's fun. Um, uh, sometimes even trends, sometimes, you know, it's like fashion, sometimes pink is hot, next year maybe it might be purple, so people are looking for those kind of things. Um, but really, it's, 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 it's how it's performed already in, in trial gardens, because um, quality is really important to us. We want to make sure that the product arrives to wherever our customers live, uh, and the product is going to, uh, you know, it's going to mature and do well for them. Are you so, seeing any trends for this fall? Um, any specific colors? I know like in the seed world and flower world, uh, pastels are really becoming big right yeah. now. Are you seeing that in the bulbs And as well? pastels probably are, are big as well. Um, obviously, in the fall, tulips and daffodils and crocuses would be our, our main. Um, but um, but um, Darwin tulips, for example, everybody loves a Darwin tulip. Um, and the um, you can't you really can't go wrong with putting a daffodil no, in your garden, whether no. they're white or yellow, short or tall, they're all great. Yes. Yeah. So um, why don't you speak a little bit about um, the journey that these bulbs take to get to us? And just before you answer, um, anyone who's watching in the comments, feel free to ask questions to Glenn um, or get your questions geared up for when we start answering plant questions. But yeah, so what journey do they take? So it, it can be a very lengthy journey, not for everything though. So lots of our product um, is sourced regionally, so that's not too far. Uh, but um, we have some products who come from a grower in Langley, BC. We have a few growers in the U.S., two in Michigan, one in North Carolina. So that journey's not too long. But most of our products come from Holland, from uh, the exporter that we work uh, with there. 
Uh, they are one of the largest exporters in the world. Um, basically, the growers would bring their product to them. So I'm a, I'm a Glad grower in Holland. I grow my Glads. I bring them to the exporter. They grade them um, uh, very rigidly. They want to make sure that they pass the test and that we're going to like them and our customers will like them. Um, and there's also actually a CFI, Canadian Food Inspection Agency inspector, in Holland for six weeks and they live there. So they're also inspecting the bulbs too to make sure that they're worthy of the journey. Um, but basically, so the, the bulbs would get dropped off. Uh, our, our exporter there would basically bag them like this and uh, put them in a box, uh, fill containers with them and ship them from, uh, track them first to Rotterdam, put them on a container ship. Uh, we had four container ships coming from Rotterdam this year. They go to Halifax. We uh, send a truck to Halifax and bring them to our facility in Charlottetown. Then we store them properly here, whether they're warm or cold, and then uh, they're in a box and they go to a customer in Manitoba or Newfoundland or wherever our customers are. So not only are you uh, a plant-like lover, you're also a logistics specialist. Well, we, <laughs> we have to be a little bit, yeah. There's a lot of inventory coming at the same time and we, we have to get it to customers when they need it. Uh, this country is pretty big, right, as we all know, and has a huge variation of zones, right? Mm -hmm. So we've had, we've had people in zones six through nine who've been looking for their stuff since February. Yeah. And we have people in probably northern Manitoba who say, please don't send it to early May. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a bit of a challenge to get it there at the right time. But that's our goal is, is we're putting it in a box and saying it to a customer when it should be a good time for them to plant it. Right. And we are at a secondary location. We're not at York where everything happens. So uh, why are we at a separate location? Probably just for uh, uh, the facility York just couldn't hold this. We, we, need, we need the inventory space to basically do this. Um, so that's basically why, but you know, most people think, and most people where we are in Charlottetown, although people, they're like, there's no signage here. People don't right. stop in off the street uh, because we are strictly mail order, of course. Right. Um, but, uh, but the York location is pretty busy on the seed side alone. So to handle this extra volume as well. Especially with all the different temperatures that are required to exactly, hold everything. Exactly, right. And, uh, and uh, we are very proud that uh, uh, on the, in the bulb and perennial program, we are the largest mail order company in Canada. So we send a lot of product out of here. Awesome, Glenn. Thank you so much for joining us. It was very insightful. I hope you come back next week when we're here. Happy to be here. Thanks, Happy to right. be here. Thank you. And we're going to bring in Jeremy. Jeremy is also a certified horticulturist, and he is gearing up to take over for Glenn. Um, no longer apprentice, a co-bulb manager. You Say have hi, very Jeremy. big shoes to fill. Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we haven't had any questions come in yet, but we do have some questions that were emailed through. Um, so we'll start with you, Cody. Sure. Um, Stacy wants to know, should I be trimming my lilac bushes or letting them do their own thing? Hi, Stacy. So you can start trimming your lilac bushes after they're done flowering, get rid of those spent uh, flower heads, then maybe in really early spring, late winter, um, cut off some old growth, maybe uh, remove any of the uh, branches that are crossing, any dead branches damaged. Um, and then if you know, you're noticing your lilacs aren't flowering anymore, maybe do a regenerative um, pruning, cutting back a little bit harder than what you're used to, and then hopefully you know, rejuvenate that lilac and bring it back to life. And Jeremy, do you think it's more important to prune your lilac bushes or maybe fertilize them? Uh, I'd say you could get away with doing both. Um, most woody perennial crops do need some fertilization, but uh, with lilacs, they, they do need a, a prune uh, about every year. After flowering, just after flowering is ideal, you can clip off those spent seed heads. But uh, as Cody just explained, any time you're pruning anything, you want to make sure that you're getting any of the branches that are crossing, uh, because when they cross, they the wind blows, they kind of rub against each other, and where they rub, that creates a wound that can let in an infection. Um, and the good rule of thumb is whenever you're pruning anything, is never remove more than one third of the tree or shrub at once any more than one third and it sends off what are called water spouts and suckers just a whole bunch of thin little uh, branches that come off the tree that will have to get pruned as well. It's kind of like hair. If you're going to do some pruning, start with a little bit yeah. and then, you know, work your way down until you get to a spot you're happy with. You know, if you just go in and just with the buzz they're all right, right through the middle of your hair, like it's going to be months before you get that hair back. It's a little shocking. Yes. Yeah. Now, if you pick all your lilacs and put them in vases, you wouldn't have to prune them. This is true. Too. Absolutely. So <laughs> I love, I think we might get our lilacs here a little bit early. Oh, it's amazing. I think. We're having a pretty early spring so far. It is. They're normally like the first week of June. My sister got married the first week of June, and she had lilac-themed wedding. Oh, it's and beautiful. 
it always just like, I'm like I think they're going to be early, are for Cynthia's in bloom. Yeah, you There's, know, lilacs, one uh, little known use for them is they are edible. And uh, last year I made some really, really nice lilac jelly that was like s just pure spring on a piece of toast. It was really, really nice. I'm just imagining, you know, uh, eating that piece of toast and I'm just in a field in early June with just the <laughs> yes. scent of lilacs swirling around yes. me. Yes. And the wildflowers around that me and the butterflies flying and I got maybe a little, yeah. a nice little floral crown on, you know, something <laughs> exactly. like that. <laughs> All right. A question for you, Jeremy. Mm -hmm. I keep getting bugs on my lilies. What are they and what can I do? You could possibly be dealing with lily beetles. Uh, those uh, can be a, a little problematic uh, in the summer. Um, there's a few options. Uh, insecticidal soap is something that you can use to help deal with your lily beetle problem. Um, getting out there and just uh, squishing them uh, as you see them, as they come up, is a, is a great way to uh, control them. Or one thing, if you're dealing with lily beetles, uh, not a lot of people know of is if you have an old dust buster hanging around your house, oh, yeah. you can break out the dust buster and that goes for potato bugs as well or p uh, Colorado potato beetles. Get out the dust buster and then you can just uh, drop them into a bucket of warm soapy water and hey presto, they're all gone. Here comes the beetle buster then. The beetle buster, yeah. yeah. Copyright that. I don't know if that's going to be more satisfying than squishing them, but it would be pretty fun. It, it would. would. <laughs> like, especially if you had like a... Battery yeah. pack. It's yeah. a little faster. Yeah, you'd be like a Ghostbuster. Yeah, I would like to try that. <laughs> I've, I've also noticed too with them that like on sunny days, um, if they see something approaching them, um, you know, if they see a shadow, what they do is they hop off the plants and as they're falling through the air, they flip over with their bellies up and then land with their backs down so they're harder to find. Yes. And, you know, I think they, you know, eventually um, uh, you develop that way so that predators are, it's harder to find them. Mm-hmm. I've never looked this far into it, but I have done some research, and apparently they let out these little screams as they're falling, too, to warn the other ones. So oh I'm just God. imagining all these lily bugs all jumping off the lilies, and they're all just screaming with their bellies up, in, you know, <laughs> heading for the ground. Yeah. So the best time to really pick them off is on, like, cloudy days when you don't cast so much of a shadow. Yes, and uh, wear earplugs, I guess. Yes. I don't wanna... <laughs> uh, we do have a question. Elizabeth wants to know, since it's such a beautiful spring, what do you, do you think that I could move my seedlings into an unheated greenhouse? Ooh, that's a good question. So it depends where you are. Um, you know, it's still no guarantee that we're going to be out of those frost-free days yet. And, you know, I don't think any of your things would get frost damage on them, but they will definitely get some cold damage on them. You know, keep watching. Um, we're middle, end of April now. Maybe beginning of May you can start moving things in. Just keep an eye on the long-range forecast. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. And, you know, it can be a little tempting, especially when we have these warm days, to think, well, we, we have an early spring but it's the late frosts. That's the thing that you have to worry about. So even the, if you're having 18 degrees for three weeks in a row and you're all set to put out your tomatoes, all it takes is one frost. So uh, if you are planning on putting them out early, just be very careful on the uh, the weather um, outlook. Our weather here, we've been high mid-teens the last, you know, um, you know, three, four days ago, and then yesterday and today, even though it looks really nice out, high of three degrees in wind, yep. um, you know, that wind just cuts right through you. It does. So what would you think the, um, so she wants to move them into her unheated greenhouse. What do you think the lowest temperature overnight would be safe for her? Like going out to check at say 10 o'clock at night, temperature is what? Sure. So once they're hardened off, um, anywhere between four and five degrees, it won't harm the plants, but the plants won't be growing. Um, but anywhere, generally anywhere from 12 to 15 degrees is a low is usually a good temperature to hold plants at. And then when the temperature comes back up in the day, then they'll start growing again. All right. Uh, Josephine has a question. She says, I bought three varieties of garlic and I plant before winter. When is the best time to take the mulch or the hay? I assume take it off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and my answer is never. Yeah, leave it on there. <laughs> leave it on there the whole time. That'll help with, you know, uh, moisture retention, especially with how the springs have been the last few years. Um, we get a lot of, uh, you know, frost and heaving. That'll help you know, eliminate that so your garlic's not poking through the soil. Uh, and you know it's gonna help keep the weeds down, retain some moisture, that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. just let it go, and then you know once the garlic's ready to be harvested, you can you know pull the garlic and then incorporate that mulch into your garden as an organic material. Absolutely. And if I can just add to that, I think uh, on the topic of mulch, I think if there's one thing that home gardeners 
uh, don't do enough, it's mulching. Um, you know, some people are surprised, but two to three inches of mulch is not too much uh, if you're mulching your, your garden beds. Um, it suppresses weeds, it will keep your uh, soil nice and moist, which means less watering, less weeding, less you know, breaking your back out in the garden. And uh, it's always better to do uh, your garden with, a, with two to three inches of mulch than uh, for half of your garden than doing your whole garden with one inch of mulch. Better to find one bed and completely mulch it every other year than just doing not enough mulch mm -hmm. every year because you're just, it, it's a bit of a waste of time, yeah. Um, now that we're on the garlic, our spring garlic has arrived mm -hmm. and we have started shipping it out. Um, our spring garlic is a soft neck garlic, our fall is a hard neck. When do you think is the right time to plant that soft neck garden? I would garlic. be, if you can go out and work the soil and it's not snowing or freezing rain or any other you know gross weather, I would be going out and I would be planting it right now. Nice. And would yeah. you also mulch that? Yeah, I would go ahead and mulch it as well. Yep. All right, Jeremy, um, Elizabeth has a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. What would be the best use what would be best to use for mulch? Are you talking like cedar chips? Are you talking straw? So there's a whole range of things that you can use for mulch, even down to uh, gravel, which uh, you know some people do use. Um, if you make your own garden compost, that's an amazing mulch. Um, you know, store-bought uh, cedar wood chips, well-rotted cedar wood chips is a great mulch, you know. Uh, anytime you use a wood mulch, that's going to be introducing mycorrhiza into your garden, which is amazing for your plant health. One of the best mulches that I can recommend is leaf mold. Mm -hmm. If you have any kind of deciduous trees on your property and you hate raking up your maple leaves or, or whatever, I, I'm telling you that this is one of the best crops you have on your property. Um, gather up your leaves this fall, put them into bags, and then just put them in a corner somewhere on your property and just let them sit and break down for uh, about a year to even two years. When you open up those bags again, the leaves will have broken down to a very dark, crumbly, it smells like the forest floor, and that's leaf mold. And it's amazing for your plants, and uh, it's a, it, it looks lovely on your garden beds, and if you have a deciduous tree on your property, it's free. I was going to say, best cost-effective way. It's going to cost you, what, a couple dollars for the bags? Exactly. I, I have a very lazy man method of that. Is <laughs> I have grapes and we have raspberries and blackberries that uh, border our vegetable garden mm -hmm. back home. And because it's a very windy spot and we have the vegetable fence there, all the mm -hmm. leaves just blow into the fence and they stop there. So I kind of just let them do their things around the plants and then every spring I go and I top dress with some compost mm -hmm. and then I haven't had weeds there for years now. Oh, it's just that continued cycle of leaf compost, leaf compost. Yep, exactly. Lasagna. Exactly. <laughs> All right. I've got an email question from Riley. She says, I just ordered 25 roots of strawberries. I haven't received them yet, but I want to make sure I'm successful. What are your tips? Um, I do actually have strawberries right here. I don't know who wants these. Look at that. So there are 25 in there. It looks yep. like a small bundle, but there are 25 there. Yes. Um, you know, if you get these a little early and it might be still a little cold for you, you're not quite ready, um, you know, you can keep them in the bag in the fridge. You want to make sure that they stay a little moist, but, you know, not overly um, wet where they're going to rot. Um, and then when you're ready for them, you can put them out in the garden, maybe give them a soak for a couple of hours in a bucket, um, plant them up to the crown, and away you go. And Jeremy, do you think we're going to get berries the first year, or? Um, you might, you might. Now, uh, the the rule of thumb is that when you're planting strawberries, you won't necessarily really expect to harvest until year two. Um, some people even recommend pulling off the flowers. I don't really have the heart for that. When I plant my strawberries, you know, I may, you may get a handful, but more power to you. Um, you know, they say oh, pull off the. Uh, flowers because that'll allow the strawberries to grow roots, but they will grow roots. They'll get established. Um, now, if you're getting an ever-bearing strawberry, you might get a bigger crop, but uh, especially if you're ordering like an early season, don't be surprised if you don't get any strawberries. Uh, just find the bed where they're going to have their permanent home and uh, keep them well watered, and you can expect strawberries for years to come. Yeah, and on the point of uh, you know pinching off those first flowers, 
it's so difficult to do that, but like it benefits so much down the road if you can do that. Yes. You know, it, it might be so tempting to let those flowers turn into berries, but you're only going to get maybe one or two. You're not going to get any amount. So pick yeah. those off early. Make sure all the energy is going into the roots and plant production instead yeah. of fruit production. And then the following year, then, you know, pick berries till your heart's content. Yeah. Similar with when you're getting a new fruit tree, they usually recommend as well. Uh, even though it's very nice to see uh, an apple, you don't want the uh, tree putting that energy into producing fruit. You want it to all go into the roots. Yes. And what about the runners? They're going to put out runners. Um, yes. There's controversy about whether you should clip the runners, allow the runners, plant the runners. Mm -hmm. What do we recommend first year with these on the runners? So what we do at home in our garden is we, you know, not like a typical like you pick or a strawberry field where they're in rows, but we kind of have blocks of strawberries. Um, and we just let them do their things, but we always make sure we go in every fall with just a light tiller. Um, and we just dedicate paths in between them, no more than four feet wide. And all in between there is what we allow the strawberries to do. So if the runners stay within that little area, fine. If they go outside of that, I'm sorry, you got to go. It's a great rule of thumb to keep your, uh, to keep your strawberries under control. Mm -hmm. And one thing you can do if you, um, ever have runners and you want to maybe propagate new strawberries, uh, when that runner comes out and you'll see, you know, it has a little bit of a root node and a couple leaves coming off, you can literally take that runner and you can put it in a little four inch pot uh, right there in your garden and, uh, yep, just like that, and uh, <laughs> you, can, you can just put the runner in the pot and then after a week or two, you can snip it loose and then, hey presto, you have a brand new strawberry plant uh, that you can uh, plant later next year. Another tip about strawberries too, I don't think a lot of people know, is that they benefit so much from being mowed in the fall. If you can mow them two inches above the canopy, um, what that does is it removes all the old leaves and mulches them, turns them into a mulch. But also what that does is it takes away any um, threat or lessens the threat of having any foliar damage the following year, anything that's gonna winter over. It just gets rid of that altogether. So if you can go in and uh, mow them about two inches above the canopy, fertilize them a little bit, you're golden. I didn't know that, that's a really good tip. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And are we mulching these straw, leaving them on bare soil, giving them a cedar mulch? You could do, uh, you know, like a cedar mulch or a bark mulch, but I think the more traditional one is like just using straw. And then what, what happens if you start to see that growth coming through mid to late spring, then you can, you know, rake that off into your aisles and then that keeps the weeds down in your aisles. Yeah, exactly. Hence, strawberries. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, straw just for the winter, move it into the walkways. In the spring. In yep. the spring. Yeah. Nice. Well, Riley, you got lots of tips. I hope you were taking notes. <laughs> I'll take that from you. All right. Um, another email question is from Richard. How do I store my glads during the off season? Last year, they all went soft. And that's sad. Mm. Yeah. Um, we have a couple containers home in our basement. Um, once they're done growing for the season, we cut the foliage off. Um, we might wet the soil just a little bit if it's really, really dry. And then after that, we just leave them in the soil and we move the pot into the basement. Now, we grow ours in the containers, but you could follow um, similar rules if they're in the garden as well. And is that similar to what you would do with your dahlias? Yep, and you, we would do the same with the dahlias. You just want to have that medium there that's just a, a little bit wet. Mm -hmm. That's just going to stop them from drying out really hard through the winter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's also really important to check on them through the winter, you know, maybe yes. once a month. If there is one rotting, you can catch it early before it spreads to the other ones, and then you just remove it. That's a, re that's a really good point, and especially when uh, if you've had them sitting in your basement or shed or wherever before you plant them, uh, you know, just, just give them the pinch test. If any are soft, chuck them. Uh, you know, if, if you have, uh, you know, a cluster of dahlias and one of those fingers is a little soft, just remove it um, because it'll it'll spread to the other parts. But if they're firm, they're good to be planted. And you're going to get more of those next year. So like throwing out a couple isn't a big deal. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And I know last year we had a really wet fall and we grew some dahlias and we grew them by seed. We do the fresco mix from our seed catalog. And those Joyce and I wanted to see if we could store the tubers over winter and if they'd succeed. Um, but it had just rained. I mean, we pulled them up uh, like October 31st. Um, we let them cure in the greenhouse for a couple of days. And instead of storing them soaking, mm -hmm. sogging wet, um, we let them dry out just a smidge. 
before they went down. Every time I go into the basement, I, I go over to the box and I go, are you guys okay? And I do like a little <laughs> pinch test like this and I'm like, you guys are firm, you're good. They're good. Their eyes are sprouting. Like they're ready to be put in pots. They're, they're, they're like us. I know spring's coming early. Yeah. <laughs> like we know. Yes, but no like, stopping it now. Where are we going to put them? That's like the age old question. Like, yeah. <laughs> where do you put it? All right. So a question from Nancy. When should I plant my dahlia tubers and when should I dig them up? Do we have dahlias on the table? Should be some here. Maybe while Jeremy's uh, looking for those, maybe I'll touch on that quickly. Yeah. So dahlia is, you know, not frost hardy. So anytime close to that last frost state um, is when you're ready to plant them. And then they're ready to be put into storage in late fall after they've received a light frost, just light enough to kill the foliage. Basically what you're looking for in the fall is all that foliage to turn brown, kind of crispy. Then you're just cutting that off from the, from the tubers a few inches from the top. Let that dry for maybe a day or two just to get, any, get rid of any excess moisture and then, you know, into the basement, into your cold room, wherever you store them for the winter. Yeah. And Jeremy, um, I see all those tubers hanging from the stem. Can you cut that down or you sh should you plant that just like that? Yes, so this should be planted like this. Um, anytime you're propagating tubers, uh, it is possible, but you have to be careful because this on its own uh, is not enough. Uh, you would really need this, and, uh, I don't know, but one of these fingers mm -hmm. and then the actual tuber is right here. Mm -hmm. So if I remember correctly, this is like the food, and then this is the actual uh, where the roots are going to come out of the plant. Okay. Uh, but in an ideal scenario, you want to plant this whole thing uh, whenever you get it. And as Cody explained, this was the old stem uh, of the plant right here. And now I know this pot isn't big enough, but like you could, it might live in there for a little bit. Yeah, you could probably get away. For, you could probably get away for like maybe a month, month and a half or so. Yeah, yeah. This would be a great example of how to start your dahlias. So you know, if you just receive them and maybe it's still a little bit cold, but you want to uh, have them get a, a good head start, yep. you could plant them in potting soil in here, just like this. Put them in either a, a cold frame or a greenhouse or, you know, by a warm sunny window and wait until it starts to put on some, some green. And then uh, whenever you plant this, it's going to have lots of roots and it'll have a great head start. And for those of you at home, this pot's about six inches across and probably seven inches deep. Yeah. In case you were wondering. Yeah. You, you, you need a bigger pot for dahlias yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. I only had so much room on the table, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, oh, Isabel, here is the question period. Oh, so, oh, someone's tagging someone else to ask questions, oh. <laughs> um, which is good. Until they ask their question, uh, let me see what else I have. Oh, when should I dig them up? You said what? Right after the first right, frost? Right after a light frost when everything turns brown, sip that off. Let them dry for a couple of days, then into storage. The fresco ones that we planted from seed, do you know when they were started? We started them in the greenhouse. Oh gosh, off the top of my head, I don't know. I have so many dates floating around. The only one I can remember off the top of my head is bananas. That's a sure thing off the top of my head every time. November 23rd. November 23rd, 2022. <laughs> and they were like this tall when we dug them up. They were huge. Yeah. And just, they were still in bloom. Yeah. Just to give uh, uh, them an idea, how many plants are you trialing this year, Cody, for our trials program at So Bessies? for varieties, we're doing upwards and onwards of a thousand different varieties and cultivars this year. A thousand varieties in and cultivars. And I, I just looked this morning, we're about 700 of those are flowers, and then there's about maybe four or 500 which are flowers. You're a machine. I know. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait either. But you did say flowers twice. Oh, I'm sorry. 700 vegetables, 500 flowers. There oh, okay. Go. There we go. There you go. I'm That's very amazing. excited. I wish I was growing 1,200 flowers. <laughs> that would be a lot. That, that would be a would be lot. A lot. Um, I'm just really growing like the annual surprise mix, and I'm just going to like throw it like a fairy. Yeah. I'm like, do that. It's great. Surprise. Surprise. I get all my like gardening filled up at work. And I rent, so I don't want to invest too much time and money into a property that I don't know if the next people are going to enjoy. And it mm -hmm. might be too much work if I'm like, here's all these beds, and now they feel like they have to maintain them. Uh, yeah. So I maintain work beds. We're very lucky, <laughs> We're very lucky that we get to play gardener at work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah. do all the things, vegetables, flowers. Yep. Um, Jordan says, I should. I heard you should prune your raspberry canes. How do I know what to prune? Excellent question. I got raspberries here. 
this one's already growing. Oh, great. So this one here, so you have the Nova. Okay, so this is Nova. So so when you're pruning, what was his name, sir? Jordan. When you're pruning your raspberries, typically you have two types of raspberries. You have uh, summer bearing raspberries, meaning that they will give you your fruit in the summer. And then you have fall bearing raspberries, meaning that they will give you your fruit in the fall. And how you prune them depends on whether you have a summer bearing cane or a fall bearing cane. So in my hands here we have a Nova, and this is a summer bearing cane. So because it's summer bearing, it means that it will grow the raspberries on the second year canes. So what you want to do is any that are more than two years old, you want to prune those back. And any of the new uh, canes that are growing, you want to leave alone. Um, so that's Nova, that's your summer bearing. So rule of thumb, summer on the second year cane. And what I'm doing with those, um, just so I'm not getting them mixed up like the following spring or that fall after the leaves are gone, as soon as I'm done picking, usually some of the you know little spent heads are still there from where the fruit were, yep. I leave those on so I know which ones were the second bearing ones and which ones to remove. And then as soon as I'm done harvesting, I go out and remove them. So then it's just the, the current season's growth that I know the following year will become the second season's growth. That's a great idea. And, and I think it also... Uh, it, yeah just shows how important it is to label your plants when you put them in the ground. Uh, I know that I, I forget the moment that I put them in, what I planted, where I planted, so it can save you a bunch of headaches, especially with something like raspberries. Yeah. And don't just mark it in the garden, because that tag can get lost. Oh, yeah. A hurricane could come, <laughs> yeah. a lawnmower, a mulcher. Make a PDF. Like, do a, great like, idea. A, a rough drawing, maybe make a binder, yep. make a permanent, like, that's where I planted yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. And then I have the Ann raspberry here, which is the fall bearing um, type. Yep. Um, and then, like Jeremy said, this one uh, produces berries on the same season's growth. And then, you know, once they're done producing, you can cut them off and away you go. Exactly. So with Ann, you know, at the end of the season, you can pretty much mow them just a few inches from the ground because all of the raspberries come on next year's growth. So it's a lot easier to keep your garden tidy if, if that's uh, your goal. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth has a question that relates to this. She wants to know, same thing, but blackberry canes and when can she take cuttings to make more? So cuttings for taking more is usually best done uh, late winter, just before they actively start growing. Um, usually people do them in like sand or like a really heavy perlite soil um, and you're looking for the newest growth um, and then typically you need like some rooting hormone for that too that just helps speed things up a little bit and then the second part of her question sorry was um, uh, she wants to know um, say when to cut the blackberries and then when to take cuttings to make more sure so blackberries again I would just be doing it once the fruits done um, mm -hmm. or if I'm seeing you know any damaged stems or anything like that yeah blackberries uh, they can get a little bit they're a bit of a bully in the garden you have to keep them under control um, so it's recommended you know uh, unless that's what you want you just want blackberries <laughs> everywhere um, but uh, you know they're also also known as brambles it's the same thing you know I've got a hedgerow full of brambles I love them um, but you know they can be a little thorny although you can get thornless blackberry varieties we have both uh, we have balsers hardy blackberry we also have Chester which is a thornless variety so if you want to pick lots of lovely blackberries and you don't want to get thorns in your hands Chester is a great variety to buy good point about the, trying to keep them like under control because I was walking through my garden um, earlier this week and you know I'm, I'm walking through with like I don't know I was eating something hand on hip you know like this <laughs> and I'm looking at my vegetable garden where our raspberries and blackberries are and you know it's raspberries fence and then vegetable garden and mm -hmm. on the vegetable garden side there's just raspberries popping up everywhere yes. I was like you guys gotta go I'm sorry but yep. I need that space for baking beans <laughs> yeah, exactly. you guys gotta get out yeah can't they live together? I would love for them to live together, but I was just like, Grandma wants baking beans, I'm planting baking beans. <laughs> I know. It's so hard to like, it's so hard, but you could dig, are you going to dig them up? Give them to a friend? I don't think I'm going to dig them up. I'll probably just go in with the mower and do it that way. If they like to be, continue to live there, then I'll have to go in and get a little more serious with them with the trowel or something. You know? <laughs> they are very aggressive. I mean, we took out the raspberry bed because we lost what the varieties were and we've been mulched it and they're still like poking up. They're like, still holding on. Three years later later they're yes. still like don't forget about me you know, it's like watching the the first like superhero movie and then the villain at the end you know and you, see, <laughs> you see like the fist close it's just like okay there's a second there's
there's a second one coming in. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Raspberry, the movie. Yes. <laughs> All right. My apple tree doesn't produce very many apples. What am I doing wrong? That's a question from Linda. That's, that's a mm, good that's question. That's a hard one. That's also a loaded question. I wish Linda was in the comments so she can answer because, like, does she have one? Does mm -hmm. she have many? Mm -hmm. Is it new? Is it old? Um, so general apple tree advice. Okay, so two things probably happening. Um, one is there might not be uh, the right pollinator there. You might be getting lots of flowers, and you're like, excellent, apples are coming in great this year, and then nothing. That's it. You get flowers, and then there's nothing else. So maybe you're just missing that pollinator variety that's there. And the other thing is maybe, you know, maybe you're applying too much nitrogen to them. Um, you know, plants need a little bit of stress in order to induce flowering and produce fruit. Um, if, you know, life is really good, food is plentiful, they're fat and happy, they're like, I'll do that later. And usually <laughs> later means the following season. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And um, just going back to the, the, you know, the pruning. If you have a, you know, a, a neglected apple tree, a good prune can go a long way. If it's very, very neglected, your pruning might be a multi-year process, um, where again you're not taking off more than one third. And uh, I hope I remember all these. But as a rule of thumb, when pruning fruit trees, you've got the the five D's. So if any branch is dead diseased, damaged, or dangerous, uh, i.e. if it's hanging down at a weird angle, those can go, no problem. And then the, the final D would be design. So that's when you want to make sure that your apple tree has got an open center. What that means is you don't have a whole bunch of branches going and crisscrossing inside the middle because the more you open up that center, uh, the more light can get through, the more air can get through. That means uh, less diseases. And this will all translate to more apples down the line. And to Cody's point about uh, pollination, very important that when you're buying your apple trees, I've had this in the past where I bought a bunch of apple trees thinking they would pollinate each other because they all produced apples in October. But I didn't realize that they don't all flower in October. So you need to make sure when you're, when you're buying an apple that you get a pollination partner, which means that they flower at the same time, not that they fruit at the same time. Check out our YouTube channel. We did an excellent video on um, pollinating with blueberry bushes, uh, applicable to all fruiting trees and shrubs. Yeah. yeah. And do you have an apple tree on you? We do, yes. So, so yeah. yeah. So this is a, this is a honey crisp apple. So this is, uh, you know, a, a great... Uh, standard, excellent eating apple, great for cooking as well. And uh, this uh, this is what you'd call a whip, and you can kind of see why it's called that. Um, but uh, yeah, you could expect fruit from this on uh, between three and five years, it'll be in full production. And if you're ordering um, fruit trees, mail order fruit trees, this is typically how they come. This is normal. This tree is alive, it's just very much asleep. It just needs to be planted and woken back up again. Yeah, exactly. You can't really see it from there, but there are a lot of uh, leaf buds here just getting ready to pop. So by the time they arrive to you, uh, if you were to order one today, um, they'll be ready to go on the ground shortly after arrival. Right. And it seems small, especially when you go to like a nursery and you see the five-year trees yes. that yes. they're selling, but they're also five or six times the cost. Yes. They're five or six times the cost, and, and you know, Tara, that's an amazing point because a lot of people, where they go into a greenhouse and they want they want a big tree, they want that big impact. They want to get an eight-foot tall tree, bring it home, and, and throw it in their ground, uh, throw it in the ground, um, but that tree that's in the greenhouse, it might have been growing you know, uh, somewhere where the climate is totally different and the soil is totally different and it's been growing there for years and then you plant it in your soil and it may not uh, adapt as quickly as this, which is bare root. Uh, there's no soil in here. This is just some sawdust to keep it moist. But as a good rule of thumb, and this goes for any woody perennial, but if you get it smaller, it will grow faster and it'll be happier in, because it's lived its whole life in your particular soil. Yeah, uh, a good uh, uh, piece of advice I got one time was when you're buying large plants from like nurseries or box stores or anything like that, you're paying just for instant impact. 
Yeah. That's what you're paying for. Um, if you do something small like this, you get all you know the gratification of growing from this size to full fruit to then you know make an apple pie or something. Exactly. It's much more rewarding. Yes. Something I tell people is that if you're thinking about putting in a fruit anything now, don't wait because if you wait two or three years, you could have already had that apple tree growing. You yeah. could have had your raspberry canes established. Um, if you're thinking about it jump on it maybe that's a great point maybe jeremy knows who said this quote but the best time to plant a tree was yesterday yes, <laughs> yes. and the second best time is today exactly <laughs> all right i got a question from angie she, she says i just received my order excited to get it all planted can i plant irises glads a still be columbine lily and leactris now Ooh, that's a lot all right let's go one by one say again first of all angie if you can answer in the comments what zone are you in yes because if you're in a seven or a nine or a five if you're in a seven or nine I'm jealous because you can start planting now. <laughs> or a one. Um, but let's assume that she's in our worm 5B. Yep. Let's pretend there. Can she plant her irises now? Yep, you can do irises now as long as they're dormant. Um, plunk them outside, good to go. Do we have an iris here? We do. I think there is one there. Somewhere. Right here. <sighs> and those irises are growing. Yes. Yeah, so this is a Shaker's Prayer Iris. You can see it's already kind of in the green, as mm -hmm. they say. And, you know, if you see that growth, don't be panicked by that. You can still plant that now. Um, you could cover that up a little bit more, maybe cover half of that. Mm -hmm. um, but once that, once those plant tips he had a little bit cooler temperatures, they're just going to stop. You know, they're not going to die. They're just... They're going to be like, okay, it's cold. I need to stop growing yep. again. And then yep. as it warms up, they'll continue growing on again. Yeah. She's in a 6A. So, oh, so pretty lucky. Close She's warmer than us. Okay. So uh, this iris, we planting it? I would plant it. I okay. would plant it. Glads. Glads, I would wait a little bit longer. It's still a little cool yet for them. Uh, maybe middle to the third week of May is when I would plant them. That way you can get a little bit of root growth. And then by the time the foliage is coming through the soil, we're past our uh, frost days. Some nice gladiolus there. Yes. All right, and which way are you planting that? So uh, with the gladiolus, it's similar like a, like an onion a, a, in that it's a bulb with the uh, basal plate where the roots come out right there. You want to have that down. And then here's where the green is going to come out, and uh, this will be the top where the, where, where the uh, green shoots out. So in a perfect world, you'd want to put them like this, but uh, at the end of the day, if you put it sideways or upside down, it will still find its way up. Plants are very smart. They're in tune with gravity, so they're not going to grow with gravity. They're going to grow against gravity. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. My, when in doubt, plant it what you think is sideways. If you can't tell which is top sideways, or bottom. Sideways, you can never hurt. Sideways. That's a great point. All right, a still be. A still be, again, like the uh, like the iris, as long as it's dormant, I would be putting that outside right now. Mm -hmm. Columbine. My columbine is just starting to come up, and I'm very excited. Um, yeah. Would you plant it? Uh, it's same, similar to the others. If it's dormant, I would be planting right now. Um, you know, we bought a little bit of columbine this past weekend, and, and but we bought like plants that were forced. They're like right. full flower right now, um, and I'm just like looking at that. I was like, I need to get you guys outside, but like it is still so cold. It was three degrees yesterday. Like yes. it's so cold. Here, yes, so. It's, below it's zero. It's gorgeous and sunny, but it is cold. That wind is ferocious. Yeah, yeah with the wind. Um, lilies. Yep, I would plant lilies now. Leatris. Yep, and as long as it's dormant, I would plant that now. All right. Um, Elizabeth wants to know, I think back to when we were talking about pruning, okay. um, would we use tree wax or tar stuff on them when we're trimming the parts we cut? No, no, I wouldn't. Um, no. You know, make make your cuts on like a 45. That way, you know, the moisture or any rain doesn't sit on the cuts. So the cause is right. It'll kind of run off of them. Um, that stuff's really only safe for if you're doing any sort of grafting or if there's like major, major damage to the plant where a lot of the bark is removed and you need to cover that up from pests and diseases. Yes, and if I can just show uh, with, with an example here, so I've got a honey sweet pear here, and uh, I've seen a lot of people sometimes, there's a lot of um, misinformation about, uh, you know, uh, tree wax or paint even, um, when uh, trees don't need any of that. When you cut a tree, uh, it will seal the wound. Uh, that's why and sometimes it, it, will, it will seal over, it will cover. You know, when, when we get cut, we have the ability to regenerate and replace cells. Trees don't have that ability. They can only add cells. You know, that's why every year it gets a little bit thicker. And uh, so what I'm trying to say is the tree doesn't need any help. As long as it's a clean cut, uh, it will seal over and all the wax or paint will do will be inhibit that and may in fact 
put some uh, fungal or disease uh, pathogens in the wound and it won't be able to seal it over. Yeah, so. especially if you're using like dirty pruners. Like if you're not cleaning yeah. your pruners oh, after yeah. every thing, like if you're working on an apple tree and you're gonna go work on a pear tree, mm -hmm. clean your pruners. Yeah, totally. like another really good tip is like, we ha we've had we had f fire blight running through our orchard home the um, last couple of years. So what I do, a Tupperware container, a rag, a little bit of isopropyl, minimum 70%, soak that rag. And I'm going and we've, the fire blight, I'm going and I'm removing all the infected branches. Then once I'm done on an infected plant, I'm taking that rag out and then I'm, you know, making sure I rub everything down and disinfect it all really well. And the reason for the Tupperware is that isopropyl evaporates very fast, but if I haven't sealed the container, it's easy to move around with me and it doesn't evaporate. Um, but yeah, always, always disinfect pruners between plants and sometimes if infection is really bad, even after every cut. That's a great point. And if you're dealing with some kind of uh, fungal pathogen, I know I've, I've wrangled with black knot a lot in my uh, prunus varieties. So whether that be a cherry or a plum, you know, it's very obvious. It's a kind of dark, almost, it's a, it's a black kind of knobbly growth uh, that can grow on the branches and can be fatal uh, for uh, cherry trees, any prunus variety trees. Um, but when you're removing infected wood... There's cherry. Oh, here's a cherry right <laughs> here. So just imagine it's got some knobbly black bits right here. So when I'm removing that, I'm not just putting that in my wood pile. I'm not, you know, any diseased plant material has to be disposed of properly. Um, it's If it's leaves, it's simple enough. Um, don't put it in your compost at home. Uh, you can potentially put it in your compost that gets p uh, picked up by your city or, or county or whatever, because their compost piles are so big and so hot, it will kill the uh, diseases. But if you're removing diseased branches, those you need to, uh, you know, you, you can burn them if that's allowed where you are, or you need to dispose of them, get them off your property properly because if I'm doing my early spring pruning and I've got a big pile of black knot infected branches even though they're cut once the temperature rises above 15 degrees Celsius those fungal spores start getting released into the air and now you've just contaminated whatever they're close to so. yeah I'm starting. Um, I just cut my first Japanese knotweed out of my garden. I've been oh, fighting that. Uh, and that has to go into my waste. I can't put yeah. that in my compost bin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's too invasive. It won't Absolutely. die in a big compost pile. No. I have to put that in my waste. Um, it's a particularly nasty plant, Japanese knotweed. Very, very hard to deal with. But Tara is very good at it. Yes. <laughs> we're fighting uh, mint and uh, Jerusalem artichokes at home right now. Yeah. They're just taking over everything, and it's just a nonstop battle. Not yes. quite as invasive as, of, as Japanese knotweed. I'm, I'm sorry you have that problem. <laughs> so I've got knotweed, you've got mint, mint. and you've got... Water. I've got <laughs> standing water. Yeah, standing water, flooding. You know, that's uh, where I live. It's very boggy. And so everyone's garden has a certain amount of challenges that you need to learn how to ad adapt towards. So, what, so what I've learned is that, you know, every gardener is battling something, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, exactly. And when you go on Pinterest and you're like, I'm going to put in a garden and you're looking at these gorgeous gardens, like just beyond that picture, there could be something dying or mm -hmm. diseased. Um, Nothing is 100% a no, success. No, no. Uh, a good piece of, I'm just full of advice today. Another good piece <laughs> of advice I got today from uh, one of my instructors in school was, you know, a new gardener has never killed a plant, but a veteran gardener has killed thousands of plants. And that's just Absolutely. that's just how things are. They happen. Um, you know, you're not a good gardener because you've kept all these plants alive for so Well, yes, you are. <laughs> but you're also a good gardener because, you know, you've gone through those experiences and you know what works, what doesn't, and you've learned from it. Absolutely. And we learned to pivot. I mean, when we had the cucumber beetle eating all of our cucumbers coming up, we pivoted the next year and we did something different. Yep. Even if you fail, you've learned, so you haven't failed. Yeah. Um, but you 100%. just moved to a new place. You put in hours and hours and hours and mm -hmm. hours and hours of work and lost almost everything, didn't you? I did. So I, I dug a, a really, really big garden, you know, 100 feet long by 50 feet wide. We were very excited, very keen to get everything in the ground. And... Um, as a rule of thumb, which I didn't follow, uh, <laughs> but if you are planning to put in a new garden on your new property, waiting a year to do that is not yeah. too much. Mm -hmm. You know, um, take the time to walk, uh, you know, and, and to really, you know, see uh, where floods 
Um, you know, where does the sun go down? At what corner of the garden are the birds chirping the most? And, uh, you know, working on a really good cohesive design, a year is a great amount of time to wait. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you'll end up with your lettuces with six inches underwater like I did. The ones that the rabbits didn't eat. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Elizabeth wants to know what Japanese knotweed looks like. It does look like bamboo. Um, I don't want to use any chemicals to kill mine. Mine's in my garden bed. I literally go out every day and I pick them when they're just popping up and they're bright red and they're really noticeable. Mm -hmm. And eventually the roots are never getting any energy. So if I keep picking it and never letting it grow, um, it'll eventually die out. It takes three to five years, but it's, it's a natural way to do it, but it takes it takes dedication. You can't, once you let it get this high, you gotta start over. Um, it's yep. a it's an everyday walk in my garden. There, mm -hmm. There's no native bamboos in Canada, so if you see something that looks like a bamboo, there's a very good chance that it's Japanese knotweed. Mm -hmm. It's it's the worst. All right, back to the questions. All right, my hydrangea blooms used to be blue, but now they have a pinker color. What happened? That sounds like the soil got uh, more alkaline and less acidic. Yes. yes, and we have some stuff. I think I forgot to put it on the table. Thanks, Jeremy. So what's happening there is that the uh, essentially the uh, acidity of the soil has risen. Um, uh, blue hydrangeas, blueberries, rhodos, azaleas like very acidic soil. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a product called aluminum sulfate, which applying that at the at the package rate will lower the acidity of the soil, and then it'll transform those flowers back to blue again. Mm -hmm. Now, Jeremy, would you recommend someone just add that, or should we be testing our soil first? You should always test your soil, especially if it's a new garden, because you never know what's going to turn up. And uh, you know, if, if you can test your soil, uh, you you know what kind of fertilizers you can use. You know your acidity, and I think the old saying is "right plant, right place." Um, you know, I, I think that uh, as 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 a rule of thumb for gardening in general that I like to follow is rather than trying to uh, you know grow really really crazy stuff and then fight against nature to try and make it survive and grow in your own garden find out what grows the best in your garden and then focus on growing that better than anyone else <laughs> yes so for my garden for example um, I know that it floods uh, so maybe I'm not going to plant something that likes really good drainage but maybe I will plant some elderberries instead because they don't mind boggy conditions and, and they grow like weeds. So maybe I can grow the, the best elderberries better than all my neighbors. Yeah. And you could start an elderberry jam company and yeah. you could do all the yeah. things. Yeah, the possibilities are endless. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. Um, I love hydrangeas. Um, no one asked, but I'll ask this question. Um, when should you be pruning your hydrangeas? Um, buds are coming out now. What are we doing? Old sticks? We leaving them? Cutting uh, them? Wherever I'm seeing growth, I'm leaving. Um, you could do a little bit of regenerative cutting late winter, just to remove, you know, maybe the top two or three, just so you know, help them bush out, grow a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, after the flowers are gone, cut those off. They make really great dried flowers if they you do. haven't done that. So cut a little bit longer stem, hang them up to dry somewhere. Nice, like late fall, winter uh, bouquet it'll make. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely, and, it, and, and it's all a matter of taste, you know, I mean, um, you can never go wrong deadheading any of your flowers, uh, but I know some people really love the look of dried out, uh, you know, mop head hydrangeas. Mm -hmm. It adds a lot of kind of interest and texture into your garden, especially when, uh, you know, the weather starts getting colder. I believe it's the Annabelle is like the really conical ones. Yes. They hold their shape so well when they're done flowering. Yeah. They're so pretty in like, you know, late November when you get that like really light snow on them. Mm -hmm. You have some ornamental grass still hanging where it's nice and like, you know, four or five feet tall with some snow as well. It's beautiful. Yeah. And it kind of, uh, you know, going back to uh, what Tara said about testing your soil, you know, uh, where we're located, our soil is, uh, pr it's, it's a little, it's slightly acidic. Um, so if you were to test your soil and find out that you've got high acidity, well, then you know that you can grow really nice, bright blue hydrangeas without any additives, and you can probably get really good uh, blueberries as well. They're another acid-loving plant. And I've got a blueberry here, and it's in bloom. Um, but Elizabeth had a question about her hydrangeas. She wants to know, she has them growing in the greenhouse. Um, they have new leaves already. When can she plant them outside? Plant them outside after last frost. Um, they'll start really breaking bud around end of May, beginning of June. So. Just watch for those last frost dates. Once you're there, harden them off and punk them outside. Yeah, um, blueberries, I can't wait. 
I love blueberries. I know. What's less? Uh, Rita, I'm interested in growing some fruit, but I only have a small garden. What should I plant? I'm going to let Jeremy take the rain on this one. He, Jeremy loves fruiting fruiting crops, so I'm just going to sit back and enjoy it. It, it is I'll true. I'll interrupt, though. I think you should grow what you like. If you don't like elderberries, yes. don't grow elderberries. Yeah. Yes, you, you couldn't be more correct there. You know, Grow what you eat, I think, is a great rule of thumb. Or what your neighbors or what your friends eat. Um, but, you know, yeah, I think a common misconception is that you need a really big garden to grow fruit. Um, you know, if you've got kids, if you've got grandkids... Strawberries. It's one of the easiest uh, fruits to grow. They're extremely versatile. You know, you can put them in a in a pot this size, and you can have a good crop of strawberries. They've got strawberry pots that are kind of tall and have little holes in the side. You can grow a big tower of strawberries in there, even if you've just got a balcony and uh, just making sure that you keep them well watered. Um, and another thing I wanted to point out on that note. Using this Honeycrisp apple as an example. So now most of the apples that we get are on dwarf or semi-dwarf rootstocks. So what that means is this part right here is the rootstock. This part, the part where the apples come from, is called the scion. So this part would be the Honeycrisp apple part. And this part, the rootstock, you can see the little grafting line here, is where it gets its size, its vigor, its disease resistances. So if you get an apple tree on a dwarf rootstock, it may only grow eight feet high at maturity. Now that might seem, if you've only got a tiny little garden, like too much, but you know, you can train apples to do whatever you want. And a really neat thing that you can do is there's a thing called step over apples. So you can literally have an apple tree that's a foot tall. And uh, all you would do is uh, if you, you have one bud on the right hand side, one bud on the left hand side, and you would prune it like that. You would, and when these buds come out as a branch, what are called laterals, that is what the apples are going to be growing off of. So I've seen these, you know, they're only a foot tall and you allow the apples to grow it about this far on each side and that's where your apples are growing. Now you're not going to get a hundred pounds of apples on the tree. You might get six, you might get a dozen, but if you've got a, a little urban garden, you could grow them in pots, you could grow them in a raised bed. Uh, people can line your pathways with step over apples and uh, it's very easy to do. So I, I recommend everybody Google step over apples, especially if you have a small garden because you can do it with, with apples, pears, uh, anything really. It's is like it, a bonsai <clears throat> tree, but yeah. apple. Exactly. Is uh, step out, step over apples the same as espalier apples? It is essentially the same. It's just like a, a smaller version. You're 100 percent correct. So it's the same idea as doing an uh, espalier, the uh, but it's it's much easier because you're only doing one horizont, uh, horizontal horizontal uh, line rather than multiples. So. Uh, and how long would you let those branches go? Like, are you like uh, framing like with some wire or something, or giving them some support somehow? In an ideal ideal world, you would have kind of a bamboo cane on each side of your apple and one single wire going across like this. Mm -hmm. And you would have uh, just each branch that you would train out just, uh, you know, maybe uh, eight or nine inches on each side and then you just clip them uh, when, they're, when they're at that size. Uh, you'd want a spur fruiting variety of apple, meaning that the fruit comes out of the uh, out of the spur, and that will ensure that you get the, the, the biggest harvest off of your apple. Uh, there's just so many different ways in order you can like uh, grow an apple. Um, espalier, a lot of like uh, tradi or, uh, commercial farms now are growing their apples just on like essentially thick whips. Yes. And they can get more density from them than the traditional apple tree, espalier, step over apples. Yep. I'm sure there's other ways too, but there's just so many out there. Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I think a lot of people have this vision of what we would uh, now call a standard uh, apple tree. And we've all seen these on, you know, near old farmhouses or something where you have an apple tree that's 40, 50 feet tall. But now with, um, you know, dwarf and semi-dwarf rootstocks, it's really possible and, and not uh, to, to enjoy a, a small apple tree in a small garden. As Cody said, a lot of the commercial orchards, they'll only use uh, dwarf rootstocks because they also get apples faster. 
high density. Uh, they're not as long lived as standards. You know, they'll only be fruiting for maybe 10 years, 15 years, at which point you would replace it uh, with something new. And talking about the buds on the apple trees now too, maybe it's a good time to mention that. If you haven't already, start getting your dormant oil sprays. Yeah. Uh, get those, buy them, have them on site, um, and just get ready to apply those soon because it's the time to do it. I can see just one bud at the very top, they're just starting to break. And you know, if this tree was planted outside, it was a cloudy day, it might be like high single digits, low teens, I would be going outside and applying that dormant oil right now to that before the bud break. Yeah, exactly. Dormant oil, uh, you know, also known as horticultural oil, it, it's just a mix of lime sulfur and mineral oil, and it just coats uh, the entire tree and the buds. So any insects, any funguses that are waiting dormant underneath that bark are not going to be able to uh, grow and hatch on your fruit trees. And I would say it's pretty essential to have that and apply that, you know, especially during the first two or three years of establishment as well. Absolutely. You know, it, it seems uh, like a, a, a bit of a headache, but it's as important as pruning to apply your dormant oil, especially if you want to avoid diseases and insect pests. Yeah. Um, do we sell the dormant oil? Um, Elizabeth says something happens to her trees after the buds and she hasn't been getting apples. So, I know we do in our retail store. We do store. in the retail store. I don't think we do in our catalog, but the good news is is that this stuff is so is such a standard. You can find it literally anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, go to any nursery, garden center. If you can't find them there, go to a box store. You'll be able to find it at one of the three for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're on PEI, come visit us at the store yes. because we have all this stuff. We have great staff. Everything we have in our catalog, we have in our store. Mm -hmm. And the cutest giftware, like just the cutest gifts that are all plant related. Um, so we are at four o'clock, but I don't think we should stop yet. I think you should show me what else is in your box over there. Okay, what do we have in the box of tricks here? So uh, <laughs> we do have an elderberry. So this is uh, a Bob Gordon. Interesting thing about Bob Gordon elderberry. So if you have a, a, a big problem with birds on your property eating your fruits, I know I do. Uh, I like to welcome wildlife into my garden in any way I can, but sometimes it backfires a little bit, but I do believe it's a net gain for me. Uh, the Bob Gordon elderberry, because elderberries are very attractive to um, birds, ev to everyone really, but birds especially, and starlings, a flock of starlings can strip an elderberry patch in minutes. Bob Gordon elderberries, uh, they their berries are down like this. You know, a lot of elderberries, the, uh, the the berries are kind of faced up and they're very easily accessed, but the Bob Gordon variety of elderberries, the, the, the berries grow down so they're harder to access for birds. So, yeah. So, question, does the cedar whack wings eat all of the hascaps faster than the starlings eat the elderberries this, or the squirrels eat the uh, hazelnuts? This is, like, <laughs> this is like a great philosophical question. <laughs> I'm not sure, but I, I have seen a, a I have, I, at my old property, I had a huge Montmorency sour cherry tree and I was just waiting, just waiting for the day that I could go out and pick them and a flock of starlings came down and they strip the tree in 30 seconds. I ran out shaking my fist <laughs> and it wasn't, a, it, they were gone. It was all gone. So uh, yeah, they're very effective uh, foragers. If, so, you, if you want the fruit, get the nets. Yes, yes, exactly. You can't go wrong with, uh, with netting, especially if you've got an issue with birds. And you know, uh, vineyards and orchards, they have all kinds of tricks. They use netting, heavy metal music playing on a PA, you know, the sound of gunshots, anything, uh, and it's good to mix it up because the birds can can uh, figure it out. I'm afraid if I play the heavy metal music, um, a lot of the berries will shake off from headbanging too much, so maybe <laughs> yeah. I won't do the, maybe <laughs> I won't do the metal music. And you might, you might end up attracting a patch of metal heads, yeah. which are, uh, you know, they'll go through your apples just as quickly. So, Bob Gordon, genius. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Um, oh, so we've also got this really nice, extremely cold hardy Chinook Sunrise Rose. It's got a very beautiful coral pink blush. Uh, it's, it's a shrub rose and um, the same with our Canadian Shield. It's really, really good if you live in a, a, a very cold zone. This is one of our cold hardiest roses and uh, it's got a nice single flower. We like single flowers because they're more 
readily accessible for bees and important pollinators. It's good to have the double flowers, but make sure if you're growing flowers, also get some single flowers because uh, it's, it's just easier for the bees. It's about a zone two hardiness, I believe? Yes, I believe so. So our roses are all exceptionally uh, cold hardy and, and they were actually bred for cold hardiness, hence the name Chinook Sunrise. All right, so I have a question. I see it's sprouting. Yes. Um, it is zone five B. It yep. is two degrees outside. Yep. Am I planting it? So I would plant it, but I would harden it off first, yes. uh, only because this may have been living in, uh, in a greenhouse up until now. And uh, you know the, the point of hardening off, it's not just getting it used to the colder temperatures, it's getting it used to direct sunlight. You know, you, you'd think that a plant wants uh, lots of blazing sunlight, but if it's, if it's only been inside, for most of its life, the sun can kill it if it's too fast. So um, the wind also is something that can uh, that can potentially harm a plant. Roses, not so much because they're very tough, but with anything, when you're hardening them off, that's the process. You're, you're putting them outside in the morning, taking them in at night, and ideally not right in the center of the sun either. Maybe against your house, or if you have a cold frame, that's even better. And would you take it out just like that? So uh, if, uh, what I would probably do is I would soak the roots in water. Um, if you're not ready to plant it by the time it arrives, take it out of this, put it in a pot with some soil, and uh, it can sit in there until you're ready to plant it. Yep. Yeah. Anything else this, in here? I think that might be it, because we went through these. All right, and some... what do we got here? Is this hosta? We got some hostas here. We yeah. have um, we got irises. I know we have a couple different lilies here as well. And Rose mallow. The hostas. They're, hostas. Really, they're ready. Yeah. Yeah, the hostas are, are definitely a favorite. Yeah, so we, we've got some great lilies here. You know, these we could we could uh, plant already. You know, they're, they'll be very happy to plant. They're very cold hardy. Um, Rose mallow, also known as hibiscus. It's got uh, Spinderella has got very big, beautiful red flowers, and uh, it looks tropical, but it's it's cold hardy, you know. So if you are looking for an exotic garden, a tropical garden, you can't go wrong with rose mallow. It's very effective. I think we have some back in Arthur's garden. Maybe not this variety, but we have one little area in like dinner place. Like I kid you not, size of my face, and they're just fantastic late in the summer. Yeah, if you want a lot of uh, likes on your Instagram posts. Get a nice picture of your hibiscus flowering with just a little bit of dew on there. You know, you, you, you'll be very popular. So I get this in the mail. Um, am I expecting hibiscus flowers this year? Don't be surprised if you don't get any hibiscus flowers this year. It's a very vigorous grower, but it is a perennial. So it will come back next year. And when you're planting anything that's woody or perennial, the first year is about establishment. And what that means is you're just, it's getting comfortable. It's just kind of, you know, okay, I live here now. Um, make sure it's well watered, that it doesn't dry out, and uh, next year you won't have to worry about it. Kind of like when you moved to the new property that first year, I'm just getting settled in, I'm getting established, and after that it's gangbuster time, you know? Exactly, and I, I may have not followed my own rules and I got a little too excited, but uh, there so I, think all gardener, I think all gardeners get really excited. I think so. It's yeah. also hard, because like we are surrounded by these plants all day, and all we want to do is go home and plant more. Yes. Um, now, what would you do to get your bed ready for success? Obviously, I can't just cut the sod away and plunk that in the ground and expect that to live, right? Mm -hmm. What steps am I going to take to prepare my spot for that to be successful? Tell us maybe about how you like prepped your like veggie garden and stuff like this year. Yeah, so um, there's a there's a couple different things that you can do. So uh, traditionally, what that would mean was that you would you would uh, you know if, if it's a brand new garden bed, brand brand new, and it's just grass there right now, you would first remove the sod um, totally. Those that's that's a layer of uh, grass and roots that would be removed, and then you would break up the soil, uh, you would add maybe some manure or either some organic compost or uh, for, uh, fertilizer if you prefer. And what that is going to do is it's going to make sure that you have the required um, uh, minerals and uh, nutrition in there in the soil. I personally love uh, manure for this, um, but I also use uh, chemical fertilizers when it's a brand new um, when it's a brand new bed. Um, what I'm doing with with my garden this year is I'm doing a no-till or no-dig garden method, uh, which is 
rather than tilling and preparing the bed every year and weeding, I'm covering my beds with a double layer of cardboard, and then on top of that cardboard, I'm doing six inches of compost. In this instance, it's mushroom compost, and then I'm planting the plants directly into that compost. Uh, the roots will grow down, and by the time they reach that cardboard, it will be soft enough that they can go uh, through. The reason I'm doing this is because uh, my soil uh, floods, so it's going to raise up the soil level by six inches, so hopefully they don't flood, and it's also going to build the soil over time. You know, when you flip the soil, when you till the soil, um, uh, you know, the soil is filled with all sorts of um, bacteria and microbes, and one thing that they don't like is UV. Uh, so when you expose them to sunlight, the theory is it can, it can kill those uh, microorganisms uh, that live in your soil biome. And you kill the worms. You yeah. do. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think last summer I was living bilaterally through, you're like, you know, here's my plan I'm doing this week. I'm like, oh man, this is awesome. I don't have to do any work. I get all the enjoyment of watching you install this without having to do any of the work. It was a very ambitious garden and I'm dealing with that now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people, they think that they can just remove the soil, plunk it in, ignore it, never water it, never fertilize it, and then they're like, why didn't it grow? Um, and you have to you have to nourish it. That's a great question, but the, or a great piece of advice to bring up with the watering is that like, during establishment, like that first full year, like, you know, most people water maybe once, twice, three mm -hmm. times. No, you got to keep checking that thing all summer because, totally. you know, you get times of drought. Those roots aren't established yet. They need that extra moisture to help them make it through. Mm -hmm. So during establishment, that first year, just keep checking on it for water. Exactly. And e that, that goes for whether it's a little strawberry plant, your seedling, or even a great big tree that you picked up from the greenhouse. That first year, it's very important uh, to not let it dry out. Yeah, and I don't want to do any of that, which is why I'm just going to throw annual seeds, and I'm going to have co hos um, cosmos and bachelor buttons, mm -hmm. and it's just going to be easy. Um, you know, wildflowers are one of the greatest things you can do, not only f for the aesthetic beauty, but for the biodiversity in your garden. Um, I think I, I, I read somewhere that you know trees, you know, something like an oak. Is, uh, you know, a mature oak is amazing. You know, if you've got a, a great big property, that's awesome for the biodiversity. Um, but if you don't, it's way more effective to have a little bit of meadow, you know, a little bit of high grass that you keep um, high, you know, all insect life is important somewhere in your ecosystem, even though the bees are, are important. You know, wasps are important. Earwigs, believe it or not, are important. Even aphids believe it or not, have a place in the food chain. And uh, whether that means that they're feeding the birds or, uh, or, or whatever, um, they all have a place. Mm -hmm. uh, Elizabeth asked, do you, have a, do you do anything before spreading wildflower seeds? Now, there is a method and you know, you're doing this like no-till, you got it all planned out. Um, I like to lean into what's called chaos gardening. <laughs> um, I'm gonna pull out any major weeds from my wildflower patch, um, but literally last year I just threw them. Like I didn't do anything. You're supposed to rake it and till it and then like rake them over and water them in, but I did it in the rain. I literally just threw the seeds. Um, I'm gonna do it again this year. Um, it's chaos gardening. Yeah, it's, it's becoming very popular. People are just like, they just want flowers. I'm like, take yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but if you really want a nice, pretty, established, weed-free wildflower bed, till it up, let it wait three weeks, till it again, plant it, rake it over, or just throw them. Yeah. <laughs> and, and a good rule of thumb with wildflowers is we have, we have a lot of different wildflower mixes at Vessi's. And uh, the, the rhyme that I always was told was when, you're, when you have a meadow or a wildflower patch, the first year it sleeps the second year it creeps, the third year it leaps. So what that means is because in those seed mixes, there's a lot of perennials and things like that, and you've got native wildflowers that are coming in. So you know the first year you're gonna get all those annual seeds coming up, and they're gonna drop their seeds. By the third year, you have all your perennials popping up too, and it's really gonna look astounding. Yeah, the first thing I had in my garden was candy tuft in the seed, it came up first. The next thing was the cosmos, mm -hmm. um, some marigolds, and then right at the end of the season, like my gallardias were coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, oh, I can't wait for next so year. So beautiful. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna throw more seeds in, cause you know, there were some spots that 
that didn't do well. And what I struggled with was like, are you a weed or are you something? Cause like there's a mix of so many different flower seeds in them. And when they're this big, they all kind of look the same. It's pretty hard to start telling them apart. It so is. They start coming in thick. And like dandelions are weeds, but they're pretty. And lupins are technically weeds. Yep, and Nicole. I love lupins. I was chaos throwing lupin seeds <laughs> all over the place in places that I don't even own. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just want to throw flowers. Um, they, they naturalize so well when we don't get involved. Just let them do their thing. Absolutely. Anything else on the table? We got this blueberry. We got the strawberries. We got the raspberries. We covered pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. One question we didn't ask Jeremy that, you know, Tara and I talk about all the time. What are you doing this year in your garden? Ooh, what am I doing this year in my garden? Well, I've got uh, 10 fruit trees waiting to go in the ground. I'm expanding my uh, raised beds and I'm doing this um, quite ambitious no-till gardening uh, project. Um, a lot, a lot of compost is getting uh, delivered to my house. I believe when I was talking to the supplier, they said it was anywhere from 25 to 35 scoops from a tractor to get the compost I need. So. Um, I'm going to have my work cut out for me this year. All the while expecting your first child. Yes, that's true. I've, I've got another crop on the way. Uh, July 11th, we're very excited about that. And uh, actually, according to my wife Annie's uh, baby tracker app, uh, as of today, the baby is now the size of a lettuce. Okay. So I don't know where like they get a little pearl gem. I was gonna say, are we talking like a... little pearl gem, romaine? Are we talking I believe... <laughs> Now they said romaine, okay. but I don't know. That's okay. that seems a little big, but I'm guessing maybe it's like more like a baby gem romaine. Yeah. Um, but uh, ain't no valley heart because that's like as long as my porcelain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This is how you tell we're plant people, like yeah. which which lettuce? Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm I... I'm very excited for that uh, that that to come up. I foresee most of your garden going to the wayside because you're just going to be like enthralled. Unless you can teach the baby to weed quite young. I don't yes. know if that's going to work. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, yeah. we are quarter after. This was a great session. We are going to be here next week as well. We're going to talk more fruits, berries, roots, bulbs, vegetables. Any questions you might have, you can always email your questions. Join us. Um, we'll answer anything that you ask. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. And if any of you are interested in any of the stuff we have here, definitely check out our website, vessies.com, and uh, you know you can you can order a catalog. You know, uh, it won't have dirt on it, I promise, when it arrives. And, uh, you know, the, the fall bulb uh, catalog just hit the presses, but there's still lots of time to order your spring bulbs, perennials, fruit trees, and berries as well. I haven't had, you know, enough time to flip through the fall catalog just quite yet. It's been a pretty busy week. But the inside cover, I was like, okay, everything on the inside cover, I want it. There are some really cool I'm things. Not, I'm not going to talk about them. I'll let them maybe discover that, but I was like sold instantly. Yeah, yeah. It's very exciting. There's something about spring, though. Like, I'm out every single day, like, looking, like, is there anything coming up? Like, I got tulips that are, like, out of the ground this much, and yeah. I'm, like, moving the dirt around. I'm like, come on, you'll yeah. be okay. <laughs> yeah. That's called a plant walk. That yes. is a plant walk. Yes. I got fritillaria coming up. I've got crocuses in my grass. Yeah. Um, every day, I'm, like, out there. I do it all fall summer me too, too. Yeah. yeah but there's something about that first new growth in spring when you're just desperate to grow and after play. all yeah. the snow and the darkness you're like please give me something green yes <laughs> yes some something to smell some yeah. color we're dying for it yes all right guys well thank you so much for joining us we really appreciate it and we'll see you the same time same place next week and i think my foot's asleep from sitting on it <laughs> all, right. all right bye everybody bye